Hello and welcome to From Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor for this class, and this is Lecture 32, the third part in a series of lectures on the topic of total regression. Remember that total regression is what we do when we have errors in both the x variables and the y variables in our regression. The regressors are predictor variables and the response. Um, this is also called errors in variables or sometimes um, measurement error models. And I'd like to bring up another method of doing a total regression under certain special circumstances. It's called Deming regression. It's a statistician and quality guru Edward Deming. Consider a straight line model. Uh, we have measurements in X and we have measurements in Y, and both of those measurements include errors. Then let's also assume that those variables are normally distributed and that the variance of, of the X measurements and the Y measurements are both constant. Because the, the variances are constant, the ratio will be constant. Then let's suppose that we know what that ratio is. We'll call it lambda. Lambda will be the ratio of the Y measurement errors, uh, variance of the Y measurements, to the variance of the X measurements. If we know what that ratio is, we can do uh, a maximum likelihood estimation of the slope, and we arrive at the equation shown below. Note that lambda is usually dimensionless if both x and y are the same uh, variables measured two different ways, for example, like in a calibration curve. But they need not be, right? So you could have x and y having different units. So lambda could be a, a measurement with units on it. A common example when we would use a Deming regression is like orthogonal regression, a calibration curve. But sometimes we do a calibration where we measure the same thing in two different ways. And one of the measurements is a highly precise measurement technique. It's our standard. It's, it's the best way of making a measurement. And then on the other side, the other axis, make that same measurement but with a simpler or cheaper or uh, faster way of making the measurement. Maybe one's a laboratory measurement and the other's a field measurement. We go out in the field and we... We can do something quick and dirty. Uh, so that the uncertainty in the measurements can be very different. If that's the case, and we have a set of samples, we're going to measure them in both techniques as a way of calibrating the cheaper measurement method as compared to the more expensive measurement method, lambda might be a number different from one. Uh, in orthogonal regression, I think you'll almost recognize right away that if I let lambda equal to 1 here, I get the exact same expression I got for the slope for orthogonal regression. Because, of course, orthogonal regression, we made the assumption that the errors in the x variable and the errors in the y variable were identical. Now, as I said, the Deming regression is the maximum likelihood estimator if both x and y are normally dependent normally distributed and independent so that their errors aren't affected by each other, and that this ratio of variances is known. In general, we have to estimate lambda from external knowledge. We can't use the data itself to figure out what lambda is. We have to use some external information. Also, I'd like to mention that in some references, they have lambda as the opposite ratio, so the x measurement variance divided by the y measurement variance instead of the way I have presented it here. I wish there were a universally established standard. Everyone did it the same way, but I think the way I've done it here is the most common, but occasionally you will see uh, references where they have it opposite. So whenever you're reading a book or a paper on the topic of Deming regression, make sure that you look for how they've defined what lambda is. If we do a Deming regression, we can also use the results of that regression to estimate the true value for x. Remember, we have errors in both x and y. 
And in fact, it's kind of arbitrary, which thing you define as being X and which you define as being Y. So we can get predicted values for X as well, and uh, they're given by this equation. If you were to take your predicted values of X and compare them to your measured values of Y, we could do an ordinary least squares regression. This is, of course, after the fact, after you know what X hat is for each of your data points. But if you did, you'd get the exact same fit as your Deming regression. It's kind of uh, the, the nature of what a Deming regression does. It allows you to adjust the X values to be their best fit or predicted values. And then after that, everything looks just like an ordinary least squares regression. Why? Because after we've figured out the best fit values of, of all the X, then there's no more uncertainty in the X and everything looks exactly like an ordinary least squares regression. What about residuals? Whenever we do a regression, we're going to do some analysis on the residuals, aren't we? What are the residuals for a Deming regression? Well, there's actually three kinds of residuals you can think about. You can think about Y residuals. Well, that's simply uh, what we have right up here. YI minus S fit YI. Y hat. Y, YI hat. Right? So that's like a Y residual. But when we're done, we also have an X residual because I have XI minus XI hat. In fact, all of this is a X residual. So we can calculate a, a residual for the Y values and a residual for the X values. But what the Deming regression optimizes, it, it minimizes the sum of the squares of the Deming residuals. The Deming residuals are also called the optimized residuals are given by the bottom equation. And you can see that there are a weighted sum of the squares of the X and Y residuals square rooted. Right? By convention, we use the sign of the Y residual to determine the sign of the Deming residual. But uh, um, it's the uh, Y residual squared divided by lambda added to the X residual squared as the square of the Deming residual. Generally, we'll do our residual analysis using these optimized residuals, since that's the thing we're minimizing. And uh, we can standardize them and uh, look at internally and, and externally studentized residuals as well. Interestingly, Deming regression and the geometric mean regression are related to each other. Remember, in the geometric mean regression, he said that if we have only natural variation, all the variation I variable comes from the uncertainty in what Y is. All the variation in the X comes from the uncertainty in what X is. I'm not systematically changing either X or Y. That's equivalent to saying lambda, this ratio of uncertainties of Y to X, is simply... Uh, the variance in Y divided by the variance in X. There's no systematic variation in X and Y. All of the variation occurs naturally. In this case, uh, Deming regression slope is the same as the geometric mean slope, and it's equal to the square root of lambda. In other words, the geometric mean approach can be thought of as a special case of the Deming regression in which all of the variation in X and Y comes from randomness. Well, I promised you last time that we should talk about the standard error of coefficients, and we will. Whenever we do a regression, we get a coefficient. We have to come up with an estimate of the standard error for that coefficient. And the standard errors of, of total regression um, coefficients are non-trivial to arrive at. There's some techniques that people have developed to do this, things called jackknife bootstrap methods. I'm not going to go into either of those, how they work or how we do them. But suffice it to say that our statistical software has these approaches built in and they can calculate the standard errors of our coefficients for us. There is a way of getting at these standard errors using the method of moments estimator. It's a pretty good uh, estimate of what the standard error might be. And, and so I like to use this equation. 
shown at the bottom as a as a kind of a simple way of calculating what the standard error might be. Um, it's not quite as accurate as a jackknife or a bootstrap method, but it's almost always good enough. Uh, so if you need to analytically calculate it yourself, you can use that equation. Otherwise, just let your statistical software package like R do those calculations for you. All right, now it comes to uh, maybe one of the most important topics when we talk about Deming regression, orthogonal regression, geometric mean regression, um, all of these total regression methods, but especially Deming and orthogonal regression because they are commonly used for certain circumstances. Both of these regression techniques assume that all the variance in X and all the variance in Y comes from measurement error. In general, that is not the case. For most of the times when we measure Y, given certain Xs, there's going to be other sources of variation. There's hidden variables that are changing that we're not controlling, and they affect what Y is, independent of X. There uh, could be equation error. That is, we don't have the perfect model. We don't have the exact right model. Having not, not having every predictor variable we need is an example of equation error or model error. If you have model error, that will add to the variance in Y independent of measurement error. When that happens, Deming regression is not appropriate. If you have variance in Y, it can't be explained by your a priori knowledge of the measurement error in x and the measurement error in y. Then uh, you're gonna you're gonna be doing pretty much arbitrary kinds of of uh, regressions, moving the the slope to to be something that is not justified uh, by your data. So we need to assess every time we want to use a Deming regression. You know, orthogonal regression is a special case of Deming regression. Every time we want to use it, we have to assess whether or not it's appropriate. One way is having a lot of knowledge about what you're doing. For example, I have the exact same samples. They're not varying. I'm measuring them twice, two different instruments that gave almost the same, but some slight variations, and we want to characterize that variation with a regression. That's a perfect example of when Deming and orthogonal regression are appropriate because we're very, very confident that, confident that there is no model error. However, even when you think there's no model error, there can be. And so often it's useful to check. If we know separately what the measurement error in X is and the measurement error in Y is, we can compute lambda and do a Deming regression. If we have a reasonable number of data points, we can also compare the slope we get from a Deming regression to the slope we get from a method of moments estimate. Sometimes those two will produce very different estimates of the slope. When that happens, chances are it's because there's model error or equation error, and the Deming regression is capturing that, uh, and as a result, producing a very different estimate of the slope. When that happens, you have to evaluate whether you think Deming regression really is the most appropriate uh, for this case. And finally, sometimes we don't have a priori knowledge of what the variance in the X and Y measurements are going to be, but we can estimate them using replicates. Replicate basically means we repeat the entire experiment twice. Do it once, and then we do the whole thing over again, um, measuring every x value twice, measuring every y value twice. If we can assume that the variance in x and the variance in y are constant every single data point, then I can use the following estimators for the variance in x and variance in y. I simply take the sum of the square differences of those two uh, replicates and divide by 2n. And that gives me my best estimate of variance in x, or the same thing with y, the variance in y, if variance in x and y are constant. They don't change from data point to data point. 
So sometimes we'll use replicates. We'll simply repeat the experiment twice. Use these replicates to evaluate variance of these two things. Uh, then use those two variances to calculate a lambda, and then use that lambda in a Deming regression. I think it's always useful to check the slope you get from a Deming regression to what you get with ordinary least squares and uh, a method of moments estimates to make sure everything looks consistent. Finally, let's review the four different regression techniques we've talked about. Actually, five if we consider the fact that we could swap meaning of x and y, and we'd have a slightly different we'd have a different formula for the slope for an ordinary least squares regression of x given y. But uh, the the ordinary least squares regression gives us one particular slope. Geometric uh, um, mean regression gives us another one. Orthogonal regression gives us one, and Deming regression gives us one. But as we've discovered, these are all related. In fact, Deming regression is the most general of the four. If I set lambda equal to one, my Deming regression becomes an orthogonal. If I set lambda equal to the ratio of the variances in x and y, y versus x, then a Deming regression gives me the same thing as a geometric mean regression. And if I let lambda go to infinity, I get an ordinary least squares regression of y, assuming x is a constant. Likewise, if I let lambda go to zero, I get an ordinary least squares regression estimate of x, given that y is a constant. So all of these regression estimates are, in fact, special cases of the Deming regression. Uh, I'll mention just at the very end the intercept. The intercept is calculated the same for all of these regression techniques. Once you've got the slope, you simply take the mean y, y minus the mean x times the slope, and that's your estimate of the intercept. And the standard error of the intercept is exactly the same as we've seen it before. So nothing new about the intercept. Finally, if you're more interested in total regression and how to use it and what to do, uh, here are some good references. I especially recommend Fuller's um, Measurement Error Models book. All right, lecture 32. What have we learned? Our last PowerPoint lecture on total regression, our next lecture, we'll be using R to do total regression. What is Deming regression and when is it useful? How does Deming regression relate to OLS? geometric mean regression, and orthogonal regression. How can we use replicates to estimate measurement uncertainty? And finally, when is it improper to use Deming regression when we know that there is uncertainty in X? That's our lecture. Until next time.